As if the McCrispy couldn't get any better, Bacon and Ranch just entered the chat. The Bacon Ranch McCrispy, available at participating McDonald's for a limited time. Ba da ba ba ba. This episode is sponsored by State Farm. Choices are great. Like with your podcasts, you get to choose what you want to listen to. And State Farm believes insurance should work the same way. That's why the State Farm Personal Price Plan helps you get the coverage you want at an affordable price and a policy that helps cover what you value most. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Call or go to statefarm.com today to create your State Farm Personal Price Plan. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. Welcome to the family here on Purple Mafia. I am your host, Paladino Joey, or Joey Awajan. Purple Mafia is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podman, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn Radio, Audible, Stitcher, Double Twist. Heck, it's even on Podbean, I guess. I didn't know. So, I mean, you can just go on and on and on. It's great to be on all those applications. Thank you for downloading and listening to the show. It is a great pleasure to be back on board with you once again today as Pearl Mafia will just keep rolling. Today, the main feature, of course, will be the Super Bowl review. I'll do my best anyway. (laughs) This and that, because obviously I was a bit upset, a bit sad, a bit frustrated with how things finished up. And I'll get to that in segment number two more so. Segment number one will be Vikings news and talk, but then, of course, there will be a much more Vikings-centric show coming up when uh, Mr. Kevin O'Connell has his press conference and everything, and there's more and more news as coaches coming in. As There are at least three coaches in place here, or at least coming into place. There's two for sure, and a third one's coming in place. We'll get to that very shortly here. But uh, again, there will be much more of a, again, Kevin O'Connell part two, basically, because we had to wait an extra couple weeks with the the Super Bowl. Um, He can't announce the head coach of the Minnesota Vikings when he's the offensive coordinator of the Los Angeles Rams, the now world champion Los Angeles Rams. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm I'm really, really happy for L.A. You know, boy, they need more championships in L.A. Boy, they need more attention. God, they need more attention and more money, more glory, more fame and for... Ah, uh, get the... Get just go away. Please. I'm sick of L.A. We'll leave it at that. I'm sick of it. Uh, as for, again, the coaches coming in. Now, of course, again, Kevin O'Connell is your head coach. He's offensive-minded. He's 36 years old. Um, <laughs> Sean McVay, 36 years old. It's unbelievable. It's absolutely crazy. Um, I can't believe Sean McVay is only 36. It's like he was only 30 when he was hired for the LA Rams. So I guess a Super Bowl was bound to happen since they hired a super duper uh, young guy who knew what he was doing and got them to the Super Bowl once with Jared Goff at quarterback. And now, again, it was all number one picks. It's all number one picks. Number one pick, Jared Goff going to the, uh, you know, (laughs) number one pick, Jared Goff helping the Rams get to the Super Bowl again with that great defense of Aaron Donald. And then they trade for number one pick, Mr. Uh, Matthew Stafford. And then they played a number one pick in the draft in Joe Burrow. Okay, I'm already way off track here, and I apologize. Back to where I need to be, at least for this segment, the Minnesota Vikings. So we have a defensive coordinator. We have a defensive coordinator. He is 65-year-old <laughs> Ed Donatel. And there's conversation about Ed Donatel employing the uh, 3-4 defense, 3-4 defensive line and all that, with Mike Pettin also coming in, formerly with the Green Bay Packers. He'll be the defensive assistant for Ed Donatello. Donatello, the Minnesota, uh, the, uh, Minnesota Vikings. Donatello with the uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and of course Donatello had the purple headband, so perfect. Kawabunga, dude. I, I was going to get some sound bites. Maybe I will at some point. I do have turtles, uh, a, a bit of a turtles theme on this show. Of course, the ending is the Sewers Internals 2, and occasionally I have the other one, which was the old school ending for this show, where it was the the dam, the dam where you're swimming around, you know, diffusing bombs in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1, a very difficult level in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1. In fact, that whole game was ridiculously hard. So there's always been a little bit of a Turtles theme on this show, Castlevania and Turtles. I like to mix those two video games into this show. Of course, retro, nothing, nothing anywhere near recent. 
Uh, Mike Patine is 55. Ed Donatello, no, Donatello is 65. Let's get to Ed Donatello first. He, again, is your defensive coordinator. He started as a graduate assistant for Kent State in 1979-1980. That was when I was getting born in 1979. So, wow. Yep, July 1979, Washington, graduate assistant, 81-82. Pacific defensive back coach, 83-85. Idaho defensive backs coach, 86 to 88. Cal State Fullerton. Sounds like a basketball team in the uh, def- in the NCAA tournament, which is coming up not too long from now. You want to get to Unvigit for those. Those are fun, of course. Cal State Fullerton, 1989. The good old days. New York Jets defensive backs coach, 1990 to 94. So 30 years ago, he started in the NFL, and I don't think he's gone back to college or anything like that. Doesn't really? Nope. <laughs> and it certainly hasn't. Denver Broncos. Secondary coach, 95 to 99. A couple of Super Bowl rings there for Ed Donatello. Donatello, I'm just kidding. New York Jets are obviously a dangerous team at times. Green Bay Packers defensive coordinator, 2000 to 2003, and it didn't end so well, apparently. Packer fans are making fun of us because they like to do that. Atlanta Falcons defensive coordinator right after that, 2004 to 2006. Of course, they were decent with him as coach. I remember 2000, They were their defense was pretty tough. That was a really good Green Bay team in 2000. 2001 and such. That was a really good uh, football team, actually. We continue to move forward. Thank you very much, and thank you Wikipedia, of course, for always give, providing us information, which is always nice. Got to cite the sources, otherwise I'm being, you know, an ass and I'm plagiarizing, supposedly. Yeah, no, it is plagiarizing, technically. New York Jets special assistant, 2007, so that's a drop-off from Atlanta, unfortunately. Atlanta started to suck around that time. That's when things really started to go down the you-know-what, well, in 06, 07. With Michael Vick and the Atlanta Falcons of the whole dog situation. That was a little weird. Did I get a phone call? Oh, no. It's nonsense. Okay. Nonsense phone call where a little kid picks up the phone. My One of my nieces is, like, really young. Just pick up the phone randomly and call just for the heck of it. Okay. Back where I need to be. Washington defensive coordinator. The Wash... Oh, let's just call him Washington. We can't call him anything now. Oh, no. Okay. The Washington commanders, I guess, since we got to be... Yeah, Okay. Defensive coordinator 2008, Denver Broncos, back with them again. He's he was with Denver, Denver, Denver. I believe he was with them for three stints. This is stint num- numero dos. Secondary coach, 2009-2010. San Francisco, 49ers, when they were really, really, really good with Jim Harbaugh. He may have been with uh, Jim Harbaugh anyway, possibly. If Jim Harbaugh, yeah, that guy came to the Minnesota Vikings. Since I said his name three times in one sentence, terrible grammar. Defensive backs coach, 2011-2014. Chicago Bears defensive backs coach, 2015 to 2018. Notice the theme here. Denver Broncos defensive coordinator, 2019 to 2021. Minnesota Vikings, 2022 to present, which is the present. Um, So lots of defensive backs, defensive backs, defensive backs, defensive backs. Mike Zimmer was that as well, though. So I guess, again, I mean, it doesn't mean necessarily our secondary is going to get a million times better. But uh, it's it's possible, hopefully. It's a different coach, about the same age. He's had good times. He's had bad times. It's a fresh start in a new organization, just like I'm sure Mike Zimmer with a fresh start in a new organization with a Canadian accent will be uh, much better. I always call it organization because of, it's just embedded in my soul watching and listening to hockey for so long. <laughs> organization. Um, check out Brave the Wild, by the way. Two-time Super Bowl champion, like I said, the back-to-back Super Bowls and the John Elway uh career, you know, at the, the end of his career, it all's well that ends well, right? With the, the heartbreak earlier in his career, having those wonderful playoff runs only to end getting demolished by teams like Washington and San Francisco in the Super Bowl. Um, instead, he demolished uh, Atlanta and the, well, it didn't demolish the Green Bay Packers. That was a really good football game. In fact, one of the best in many years. Kind of, sort of ended like the LA game. Not really. Yeah, actually it did. They, they made a defensive stop. Yeah, they made a defensive stop on the, the Packers. And then L.A. took over and kneeled down. So, yes, actually it was exactly like that. Much to my chagrin with Cincinnati, but much to my unbelievable delight with Denver. Because I really liked Denver. It wasn't just, oh, I hate Green Bay. I want them to lose. Yeah, I, I hated them during that time. Hated them. That's when the, that's when my hatred was at its peak, honestly, for the Packers. When I was I was a pretty young guy back then. I've, I've simmered over the years. Especially as Favre kept getting better and more historic. Over the course of time, I started appreciating him more and more by the early 2000s. Um, so that's great. Ed Donatello, we'll see. Lots of experience. So about 50 years combined between Ed Donatello and Mike, Pet- Mike Pettine. Mike Pettine. Mike Pettine. 
is coming in to be a senior defensive assistant, 10 years younger, from Pennsylvania. Ed Donatello was from, okay, I'm just kidding, was from Akron, Ohio. That sounds very familiar. <laughs> LeBron James area, I guess. Yep, yeah, that's LeBron James land for the most part. So let's get to Mr. Patini. Patini, uh, he will again be the senior defensive assistant. What that means, I don't know. He's just going to be good at it, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so we may go for a 3-4. I kind of hope not. I think that'd be weird. It'd be too much change. But maybe it's for the better. I don't know what to make of 3-4. Apparently the Minnesota Vikings haven't employed it since 1985 or 82. There's kind of conf uh, conflicting reports on that going back into history, but basically the early half of the 1980s, the Minnesota Vikings have not employed a 3-4 defense whatsoever. So I'm used to 4-3. Two, two tackles uh, and two defensive ends. I'm just, I'm, I'm used to that. And three linebackers. So middle linebacker and two outside linebackers. This and that. So it is what it is. And of course, as you change the defense, you become more nickel and all that type of nonsense. Nickel and dime. You eventually only have two linebackers and blah, blah, blah. Most of you know that maybe some of you more than I do. He was a graduate assistant for Pittsburgh. So again, him being uh, Mike Pat Patini, 93, 94. Graduate assistant? Hmm. William Tennant High School. Wow. 1995, 96. That says I was getting into Hopkins High there. Uh, leaving Maranatha Christian Academy, unfortunately. That was a sad day for me, but it is what it is. Hopkins High, I, you know, hey, you know, kind of toughened me up for the world. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely a culture change. Uh, Baltimore Ravens. <laughs> Coaching assistant, what is up with these jobs? The weird jobs, but it'll, it'll, it'll get better. 2002-2003 with the Baltimore Ravens after they won a championship. Baltimore Ravens assistant, def what is going on with these jobs? De assistant defensive lines coach. 2004, how about chief of engineering on the Starship Enterprise? What? No, that would be too high. He'd have to be the assistant to the chief engineer, Jordy LaForge. Baltimore Ravens, 2004 to 2008, outside linebackers coach. All right, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> but it's just the outside linebackers, though. Oh, that, those middle, those inside linebackers? Oh, no, 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 no. You are not coaching them. No, 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 no. New York Jets, 2009 to 2012, defensive coordinator. All right. Buffalo Bills, 2013, and of course, I'd heard of him before. Everybody had heard of him. Defensive coordinator for the <clears throat> Buffalo Bills in 2013. Defensive coordinator, Cleveland Brizounds. No, defensive. What am I looking at? Cleveland Browns. Yeah, Buffalo Bills defensive coordinator. Yeah, he was the head coach. Yep, and I remember that for a couple of years with the Cleveland Browns. Yep, I do remember. Everybody in Cleveland, it was just so short, and they kept getting fired right away, and they'd have a bad record. It just, they just you just couldn't win. It was, they were they were the real Detroit Lions of the, uh, the uh, them being the Cleveland Browns of the AFC. Long term, it was Cincy. Short term, it's definitely Cleveland. Seattle Seahawks 2017 consultant. All right, so we're back to that again. Green Bay Packers defensive coordinator 2018 to 2020. So again, Packers fans going to give us a hard time about that. Senior defensive assistant with the Chicago Bears in 2021. Senior defensive assistant for the Chicago Bears 2022, but it sounds like he's coming to Minnesota, so it's unofficial at the moment. Maybe that's a typo. I'm guessing that's a typo because it's showing him as Minnesota on here again. So we'll, we'll see. It's been a long, illustrious career. He's had some good jobs. He's had some odd jobs, but uh, he's definitely had some moments and he was a head coach of the Cleveland Browns, which I do remember, even though it was a forgettable era for the Browns, which again, most years were until Kevin Stefanski took over for the most part. So those are two major names, or at least significant names, coming in to coach the Minnesota Vikings. Again, about 50 years of coaching experience, which is good in the NFL. Uh, it's been mostly NFL for, in fact, it has been up up from 2002 to today. That's 20 years. And then Donatello, Donatello, 30 years. So that's 50 years. Yes, simple math. Uh, great to have both of them on board. We'll see what happens. Again, his regular season record, Mike Patini, 10 and 22 as the head coach of the Cleveland Browns over a two-year span. It wasn't a pretty sight, but it was the Cleveland Browns, and I, I don't know, there just wasn't a whole lot going on. And Donatello, Donatell was never a head coach, but was a defensive coordinator many times and all these other uh, defensive back coach positions and special assistant and and uh, chief of engineering and chief of security. You know. <laughs> uh, yeah, he went to the future for a couple of years, you know, about 300 years in the future to fly aboard the Enterprise, one of, one of the Enterprises, maybe the sea, but he got off of that one in time before they were killed by Romulans and stuff. So 
yeah, let's get forward. Because <laughs> they were in the storyline anyway. Um, that's, uh, that's pretty much where we stand at the moment. We're waiting again for the press conference. The parade is tomorrow for the L.A. Rams. Wahoo. Boy, do they need it. Oh, they need that attention. Boy, LA, L.A. needs attention. Oh, goody. We'll be back to talk about it after this. And we are back here on Purple Mafia, segment number two. This is where we'll review the final game of the season, and there won't be a football game until August. And I won't do Purple Mafia until August either. Yeah, right. This off season, you think I'm not going to do a show? <laughs> of course, there's going to probably be one very soon to talk more about Ed Donatel and more of the assistants coming in and this and that. And, of course, the arrival of Wes Phillips. I didn't talk about him too much in the previous segment. I might get into him here in a second, of course. He's the grandfather of Bum Phillips and the son of Wade Phillips, of course. He's going in the other direction. I'm going to talk about him real quick. I apologize for for this. Uh, he played for the San Diego Riptide in 2002 to 2003. He, this guy, uh, Phillips, is 42 years of age, just a few months older than myself. He's about to turn 43 on Feb 17, so any he kept just a couple of days away, honestly. Happy birthday, offensive coordinator, Minnesota, possibly. UTEP 2003 student assistant, West Texas A&M 2004-2005 quarterbacks coach. That's a good theme here. Baylor 2006 quarterbacks coach, Dallas Cowboys 2007-2010 quality control def- uh, offensive assistant. It must be nice to have football coaching in the family because he was pretty young at that stage. You know, like in the early 20s, mid-20s, late 20s. Oh, how, how I wish. How I wish. Mm, I wish. Dallas Cowboys, 2011 to 2012 assistant offensive line coach. Uh, Cowboys, 13, tight ends coach. Washington Redskins, 14 to 18, tight ends coach. Los Angeles Rams, 2019 to 2020, tight ends coach. Los Angeles Rams, 2021, world champion. Los Angeles Rams, tight ends coach. Pass game coordinator. Super Bowl champion. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. Yay. <laughs> but it sounds like he will be the next offensive coordinator for the Minnesota Vikings, 42 years of age, so a bit older than uh, Clint Kubiak. Not necessarily a kid here, but nice and young and ready to rock and roll. We'll see. Again, a more quarterback-based in this one. He's definitely been a, he's obviously been a tight ends coach. He's been a quarterback's coach, uh, passing game coordinator. So that's good. That's good. So hopefully it's more of a passing game. But again, of course, you're going to use tight ends in the passing game but also good blocking for the running backs and other receivers at the tight ends. So there you go. I mean, what's what's wrong with talking a little more purple here? And, of course, Wes Phillips was on the Los Angeles Rams and won't be much longer, according to sources. He will be the offensive coordinator under Kevin O'Connell. And let me say something real quick. Please don't call him KOC. <laughs> Please try to not, because it reminds me of a certain politician that I just don't want to hear, don't want to be a fan of because they drive me nuts. And other reasons as well. Uh, no. <laughs> not a fan. I'll just leave it at that. Let's just call him Kevin O'Connell. You're not going to hear me use the initials. It, ugh. Anyhow, LA Rams 23, Cincinnati 20. That's all I got to say. The Rams won and the, they were, and, they, and the, the, the refs were paid off in the last drive of the game. Let me tell you, they were, okay, yeah, kind of. It felt like it. Cincinnati's first touchdown in the game, though, however, they could say the refs were paid off for that one too, unfortunately, because there was a definite face mask on a guy I really don't like, Jalen Ramsey. He is an a-hole. I mean, th- this Rams team is filled with a-holes. There's a lot of guys in this team I don't like. I mean, even Aaron Donald kind of rubbed me the wrong way the last couple of weeks. Dude, just settle down a little bit. My God. You act like the world revolves around you and your defensive line. Like, ah, oh, settle down. Settle down. You know, <laughs> you don't have to go a little, you don't have to go so overboard. So, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm happy that he got a ring. Mr., uh, Donald, Aaron Donald, and it drives me absolutely bleeping crazy that the Minnesota Vikings passed on him for a guy I'm not a huge fan of because he's just not that good. He was good as a rookie, him being Anthony Barr. Oh, and I still remember, I could still hear Paul Tarchian's voice leading into that draft, Aaron Donald, Aaron Donald, Aaron Donald, Aaron Donald, Aaron Donald, Aaron Donald, and there was Aaron Donald's team moving up in that draft. The Vikings passed on him, and two picks later, this team in Los Angeles, 
or was it St. It was still St. Louis, yeah, St. Louis at the time, because this is 14-ish, when Mike Zimmer took over, the Minnesota Vikings. Oh, God, could you imagine? Oh, 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 oh my. Um, Aaron, man, the pass rush would have been absolutely off the charts. Aaron O'Donnell and Everson Griffin, just as he was getting in his prime. And then passed from Griffin to uh, um, Daniel Hunter. I mean, Daniel Hunter, it may have taken longer for him to emerge because of that, but may maybe not because uh, Mr. Griffin was getting older. He could have been in more of a reserve role, him being Griffin. This and that, and his off the field issues. Unfortunately, God rest, uh, God bless him. Not God rest his soul. He, he he better live another seventy years or something. I'm you know I'm just saying, might be an exaggerated number, but another 50, 60, 70 years. Um, God bless him. Um, but what an unbelievable pass rush that would have been. Uh, you know, and then instead of the uh, off and on disappointing frustrations of the hot and cold Anthony Barr, which could drive everybody crazy. Joe Mixon also ties with him and uh, Mister. Calvin Cook. People were talking about Joe Mixon, Joe Mixon, Joe Mixon, Joe Mixon. Yeah, he has some off-field issues, but if, maybe he'll work out great. And then the other guy, Delvin Cook, had some off-field issues, but maybe he'll work out great. Ended up being Delvin Cook the Vikings traded up for, and then Joe Mixon was right around that same time in the draft in the second round. Either one of them could have easily gone in the first, but the off-field issues forced them into the second, where Cincy and Minnesota decided, you know, let's go for it, baby. Let's go for it. Um, let's have some fun. So, at the end of the day, ended up being an okay football game. The halftime show wasn't as bad as I expected. Uh, I am not a hip-hop guy. I am not a rap guy. I am absolutely, positively not an Eminem fan. I can't stand the guy. I hate his voice. He's got a big mouth. He's an ass. <laughs> I, I just, there's nothing, to, I, I have nothing, I have nothing but, to, you know, let's say, not say hatred. I have nothing but dislike for Eminem. Uh, some of the others, eh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, Snoop Dogg's entertaining. He's he's kind of funny. <laughs> he's he's kind of funny. Uh, some of his uh, off the mic stuff, I'm not a fan of. Let's just say some of the things he says, I'm not. I don't agree with. Let's just leave it at that. But that's most of these guys. Uh, obviously, they're not. Some some are some are better than others. This and that. But the one I think I swear the one reason why this wasn't that bad is because of how absolutely terrible modern music is, especially hip-hop. It is so bad. It is so obnoxious. And then you hear that, and it's like, you know, I, I was expecting this to be just the most disgusting thing, you know, not, not disgusting, but the most, like, I can't stand it. Turn it off. It's 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 awful. It's not for me. Um, but it wasn't that bad. <laughs> it wasn't that bad. I'm still not a fan, and all that. It's not for me. I'm an 80s guy, early 90s, 70s. That's just kind of my genre of music is around like maybe some head some hair band, uh, hair band rock in the eighties, eighties uh, synth as they call it, seventies seventies R and B is is pretty damn good obviously, and seventies rock seventies this seventies that there's all kinds of variety in the seventies and it actually sounded like music more than anything else, and then early nineties could be kind of cool too, um, mid nineties I thought was the uh, when things changed very dramatically everywhere. Music, movies, everything. Video games. It just was a change. That wasn't a fun one for myself. So, but it, it kind of brought me back to the, the mid-90s, I guess, uh, with some of them. Others, like early to mid-2000s, Eminem, when music really started to stink, in my opinion. <laughs> you only scratch the surface of the smelly turd, and now it really starts to stink when you get to Eminem. Okay, back to the actual football game. Since you wanted to hear something about the halftime show, I guess. Uh, you got to see multiple... You, you, you got to see a, a, at least one trick play by both teams. Joe Mixon, which wound up with a six-yard touchdown. That was awesome. And you thought, hopefully, I was hoping and hoping and praying that that would be the turning point. Like the Philadelphia Eagles, you know, when they made the trick play to uh, the quarterback for a touchdown. Oh. <laughs> that was a crazy, crazy moment, and it was a it, it was a turning point in the game. It didn't decide the game, but it certainly uh, gave the Eagles an advantage going into the half. Coop, and then when Cooper Cup overthrew the receiver, I believe it was to Matthew Stafford, uh, but it was yeah, it was way overthrown. There was no chance. Uh, it was to get a first down. Ultimately, it was a fourth down, and the the uh, Rams had a punt. But doggone it, when the Rams needed those first downs in that fourth quarter and that final drive. They just got him. And to me, the true dagger of the game, it would have been the dagger in favor of Cincinnati if the Bengals were ready for the uh, the handoff play to Cooper Cup, which wound up 
people say, again, that, oh, that was a seven-yard play. That changed It changed everything. Cincinnati looked like they were going to get the big stop. And then possibly, hopefully, with Joe Mixon's help, we're going to run the clock out and celebrate a world championship for Cincinnati, which would have been the first championship since 1990 for the city of Cincinnati. The, the, the Reds actually have five titles, I believe, or is it even six? But I believe it's five uh, uh, World Series championships, some dating way back into the day. They had the dynasty in the 70s. No, they have seven World Series. So some way, way back in the day, they had three championships in the 70s, and then they had the uh, championship with the uh, Jose Rijo, Chris Stable led uh, Cincinnati Reds in 1990, the year before the Twins won. So it's like thinking the city of Cincinnati and the Twin Cities here with the Twins and the Wild and blah, 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 the Vikings, of course. <laughs> of course the Vikings. I hope this is Purple Mafia. Um, they've been waiting for a championship since 91. Cincinnati had been waiting for a championship since 1990. So it's like, I can still relate. I can still relate. And then over there on the other side, you got glitz. Oh, LeBron James is at the game. Oh, this person's at the game. There's Jay-Z. Oh, there's, there's uh, you know, Dr. Dre. There's this actor. There, There's that actor. Oh, there's this C-Lab. There's, uh, uh, I, I don't care. Go away. I don't care. Good for them. Great. They got their $9 billion, uh, you know, uh, jewelry and all that. I don't give a damn. Why would I want to see that team win? And do you think they even care about the game? Or do you think they're just kind of there to, to say they were there? They're just there to, because they're cool, you know. They're on top of the world, you know. That type of thing. So it, why would I root for L.A.? <laughs> why? <laughs> what do they have, 24 championships? When you combine the teams together? I was doing the math in my, in my head the other day. Of course, five of those championships belong to Minneapolis, but they took them with Minneapolis Lakers. And, of course, Lakers are not in Los Angeles, it would be, if you wanted to have an appropriate name for the Los Angeles Lakers, it would have been the Ocean Liners, which doesn't come off too well, or you could just call them the Liners. It would have been weird, but maybe they could have pulled it off way back in 1960, whatever, when they left the Twin Cities, the, uh, them being the Minneapolis Lakers. For those of you wondering what a Laker is, it is not a lake. It is not somebody fishing on a lake. It is a very, very large boat that goes through the Great Lakes. Like, if you go to Duluth with the big bridge that goes up and down, you know, that famous, famous bridge in Duluth and those huge ships, those huge boat, well, they're, they're, they're ships. They're like an ocean liner, but in the Great Lakes. That is a laker, ladies and gentlemen. Does not belong in Los Angeles. It could be the ocean liners, but not the lakers, okay? <laughs> okay? No, I'm kidding. The Los Angeles Lusitanias. Okay, that was harsh. But that one's not too soon. It was 100 years ago, but... Yeah, still God rest their souls, I suppose. That sucks. Uh, would you believe there's footage out there of when that ship was leaving the port for the last time? Yeah, with a, like some famous author waving and such off in the distance, like waving to the camera way back before World War One. Would you believe it? <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah, check it out on YouTube sometime if you're a history buff. Um, yeah, you could tell. I'm just kind of... Uh, it was a fairly good game, but it just, you know, I, I was a bit heartbroken by the ending. And it was, to me, it just all sums up. It was the Rams year. It just was. Uh, they were kicking the Tampa Bay Buccaneers' butts. There was no energy in that building. The fans were just like, and it wasn't the fans' fault. The fans were just probably shell-shocked. Like, what the hell happened here? What's going on? And then Brady started mounting his famous comeback once again. It looked like Atlanta all over again, the Super Bowl. Super Bowl 50. He gets the Atlanta Falcons all over again. They tied it up, and the next thing you know, Cooper Cup is open down the field, and it was adios bye bye. And then they, they kick the gay, you know, gay kicks the ball, and the Rams move on. And, and I was very disappointed. And then there's all the rumors about Brady retiring, and it's like obviously it had to end at some point. Twenty two seasons is twenty two seasons. So I mean, just the way the Rams survived that kind of a onslaught from Tampa Bay. That was like, oh, oh, uh oh, they really might win the Super Bowl this year. There's a chance. Um, I had a feeling they might because of that pass rush and how they were kind of on a mission, and you could kind of see it from Aaron Donald. You could just kind of see it. The old, it there's always something, there's always a story like that every year where it's a veteran player who just has this drive. That's, that's, they, I'm going to get it this year, period. Sometimes it doesn't end happily, but a lot of times it does. Not happily for me, but happily for him and the L.A. Rams, him being Aaron Donald. Uh, and that San Francisco game, 49ers were pretty much 
in control of that game. Like, not in major control, but it looked like they were going to get it done. A lot like Cincinnati. Wasn't the prettiest game ever. No, and Jimmy Garoppolo was terrible. Joe, uh, Joe Burrow was much better. Jimmy Garoppolo was terrible. Um, but, of course, San Francisco, with the running game that never ceases, innovating this, innovating that, getting the job done when they needed to. It looked like they were going to get it done. And how, again, L.A., there was that drive. Despite despite interceptions by Matthew Stafford in several games because he takes chances, he's, you know, uh, in this aggressive offense and such. It's an, it's an aggressive offense, which I hope, my, uh, which I do hope Kevin O'Connell does bring to Minnesota because look what happened. Kevin O'Connell and, of course, uh, Sean McVay. I hope he brings a bit of that to Minnesota, much less because of that gosh darn stupid, overly conservative offense we've had the last, you know, seven, eight years. <laughs> Um, yes, you threw interceptions, him being Stafford and such, and the Rams just in general, Rams, Pat, Rams passing game in general, it, you know, it caused some turnovers. But look where they are today. You know, they ended up surviving games that they probably should have lost. They should have lost to Tampa. They probably should have lost to San Francisco, and I do think Cincinnati should have won the game. But there was always that final drive. There was always the final drive by Stafford, and the LA Rams, especially Cooper Cup, who is probably the league MVP other than Aaron Rodgers, who did get it. But it's either Cooper Cup or Rodgers. And Cooper Cup at least got the postseason MVP. Which, see, to me, it's not just the Super Bowl MVP for Cooper Cup. It'd be like in the NHL, where it's the Conn Smythe Trophy. The playoff postseason, the playoff MVP. Most outstanding player of the NCAA tournament. You know, this and that. That's what Cooper Cup is. He's not just the Super Bowl MVP. I don't even like him that much because he's on the wrong team. <laughs> it, it's like that. It, it's you know he's just on the wrong team. I was rooting against him the whole way, and the reason why I picked and I could feel that the Cincinnati Bengals were going to win the Super Bowl last week, especially after they had overcame a Kansas City team that was kicking their butts. I thought Cincinnati is going to win the Super Bowl this year. That's what I felt. But there's a secret reason as to why I picked the Rams by three points. And unfortunately, I ended up being correct. Son of a gun, I ended up being correct. Because every single year in the past, for the last, you know, how many years I've been doing this show, 13, 14 years, I picked Cincinnati to win playoff games. And they always lost. Always lost. And this year, I finally picked them to lose. And they won, all three of them. And I figured I'll pick them to lose one more time. I don't want to jinx them. So it was like a double jinx. It was a reverse jinx. <laughs> the, the, the jinx, uh, the, the jinx masters figured it out and said, uh-huh, nope, nope, nope. You picked a, you picked them to lose on purpose. I caught you up. They were, they were onto my plan and the Ram, uh, yep, you're going to be right about this one, buddy. 23 to 20, a three point victory for the Los Angeles Rams. But again, it, it was the aggressive offense and that want to, to make the big play by Matthew Stafford and, again, the Rams offense, Sean McVay, and future Minnesota Vikings head coach Kevin O'Connell that helped this team win a Super Bowl. Not to mention a defensive line that was relentless, absolutely relentless, and an offensive line with Cincinnati that leaves something to be desired. Both quarterbacks were injured badly in the game. It looks like a high la- It looked like a high ankle sprain for Matthew Stafford. I mean, it's the only thing it could be when the ankle goes down, goes at a forward angle downward, and you're pulling on those huge tendons at the front of your ankle, and the front, you know, like in your shin, those big, big uh, tendons, I'm really feeling them right now, you can feel them right now too if you happen to have your shoes off or whatever, big, big tendons up there, that's a high ankle sprain when you pull those, and it hurts like sin, and it can hurt for a month at times or even longer, that is a high ankle sprain, I can't even imagine the pain he's feeling, but uh, it's like, whatever, (laughs) I got a ring, just like Aaron Donald was pointing to his ring finger last week and this week, or last game or whatever against San Francisco in this one. Like, I'm getting my ring this year. And they did. They did. I mean, I respect what they were able to accomplish, them being the Rams. Uh, crucial calls down the stretch, which, yes, they're the right calls for the most part. One of them was pretty damn ticky-tack, though, down the stretch. And my friend Paula was here, a very close friend, you could say best friend, was uh, sitting on the couch and saying, yeah, we're doomed like we being Cincinnati, because we were on Cincinnati's side, because every call was going to L.A. there. Obviously, the play where there was an obvious pass interference on Cup, 
and then ultimately the horrible uh, concussion type of uh, con- you know concussion causing helmet to helmet play on him when he caught the touchdown to put the Rams ahead, uh, ultimately being offset. So obviously that one didn't count, but then they still wound up getting to Cooper Cup anyway. Stafford to Cup ended up winning the game, but again the turning point down the stretch in that final drive where it looked like Cincinnati was going to get the stop. All of the all of Denver Broncos and run that clock out. It looked like that was going to happen, but unfortunately, it just wasn't meant to be. Damn it! Um, just just too many weapons in L.A. Too many weapons. Cincinnati was probably a bit tired. The the defense they had the great some great moments. They were unbelievable against the Kansas City Chiefs. Oh, but I could imagine older fans that remember 1988 with Joe Montana driving down that field against a very good Cincinnati team to win a very close, low-scoring Super Bowl way back in 1988. I felt that heartbreak then, and I just imagine it was just just reopened that wound all over again, an old, old wound, an old scar, and kind of caused a new one. And um, So I, I feel for Cincinnati fans today um, and yesterday and at the time of the game, obviously. Uh, and I apologize, this show was not recorded Monday morning. It's Tuesday morning, of course, as you're noticing. There was no show yesterday. Uh, I had a doctor's appointment that was scheduled way, way in, uh, in advance. For so, yeah, I mean, I wasn't thinking that the Super Bowl was going to be on val- uh, right up right before Valentine's Day. I thought it'd be a week earlier. So, in the future, I'll probably try to avoid that. It's not the end of the world, though. It's not as time sensitive. It's just maybe not the best, I guess, to have it two days after. Um, it's not as fresh, so to speak. But I guess it's fresh enough. Uh, it was the T. Higgins play. Yep, that T. Higgins was the one that had the uh, face mask on Jalen Ramsey, who did get beaten many times in the game, which I appreciated. The guy's an asshole. I mean, <laughs> I used to respect him. I mean, he's an asshole. I, I don't remember him being like that. But, like, this whole year, ever, at least ever since he got in L.A., and it all started with K.J. Osborne just getting up in his face. Dude, that he's a third receiver. He's, he's good. But what's the, what's the deal? Like, get out of here, man. I don't care if you've... I don't care if you've won five Super Bowls. Like, grow up, man. <laughs> There's just no place for that kind of crap. I know a lot of people these days, anybody under, like, 35 is like, ah, that, that, that doesn't bother me. You know, well, it bothers me. Maybe I'm just too old school for you. It bothers me. It does. Uh, just like Mr., uh, which uh, I just loved what happened uh, two weeks ago. I almost forgot his name because I put him on in my mind, thank God, because I could. Terry Kill with his constant peace sign in everyone's face every time he makes a play. That stuff gets old. It gets old. You know, it, I can understand you doing it. Maybe it's an unbelievable play, and it's a huge moment, this and that, but every single time, and then it's always up in their face. That's what I don't like. So, at the end of the day, maybe I'm too old school. Maybe I'm too sensitive. I don't know, but it bugs me. Sorry. Uh, sorry for being like that, I guess. Oh, Cincinnati. It felt like it felt like the stars were aligned for them. It, it really did. Because, again, 81, Joe Montana, second year in the league, world champion versus Cincinnati. Yep, with Kenny Anderson. Just like a former basketball player, same name, Kenny Anderson of the Bengals. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the second Super Bowl, which I think people keep getting mixed up. Boomer Esiason was the quarterback of Cincinnati in 88. Uh, so, yeah, let's go back to where I need to be. 20 years, 20 years after Joe Montana, Tom Brady, second year in the league, Super Bowl champion. 20 years later, <laughs> Joe Burrow, second year in the league, got to the Super Bowl with Cincinnati. I was hoping the stars were going to align for that. And that that's your next Joe Montana to Brady to Joe Burrow. I was hoping that was going to be the case. It still may end up being the case, but unfortunately, this just wasn't meant to be. Joe Burrow also had what looked like a very serious knee injury at the time, but he was able to get up and toughen it out. I mean, all respect in the world to both Joe Burrow and Matthew Stafford for not missing a single snap in the game. I mean, all respect. All respect to both of you guys. Yes. I know you can't hear me. Maybe no one gives a damn that I'm giving them and uh, applauding what they did. But as a fan of football, and in a moment like that, in the fourth quarter, in both cases, all respect in the world. Uh, other major story in the game was, of course, uh, an ACL. An ACL for Odell Beckham after making some really big-time plays. And I remember how he just dropped the ball suddenly. I'm like, ah, oh, kind of like Dalvin Cook. Because all of your senses change dramatically when something like that happens. I mean, I can't even imagine. Just <gasps> like that. It's just like you just stop. Like, oh my God. Like the pain. The unbelievable pain. And your nerves just kind of like all for, uh, go in that direction when something terrible like that happens. Uh, 
he was amazingly able to stand and walk around. So maybe it's a partially torn ACL, but more than likely, though, yeah, I mean, obviously he's... Yeah, the good thing about football is he'll probably be back next season. If this was an NBA game, you wouldn't see him all next year. The NBA is weird that way. I don't know why, but uh, like how Joe Burrow was injured fairly late in his rookie season and came back this year and took his team all the way to the Super Bowl. Joe Burrow, all the respect in the world. I hope you can do it. I hope you can get at least one championship for the city of Cincinnati. (laughs) I think it would be absolutely wonderful. State of Ohio and all that. That's a, that's it was a long wait for Cincinnati. I, I, I hope you can do it. I, I'm a Cincinnati fan. I have a Cincinnati Reds hat. I've been a Reds fan since the 90s. Not kidding. Uh, so there's just a natural love for the city of Cincinnati for me. Uh, I like the Bengals. I, I root for them. I don't have their merchandise. But with Joe Burrow <laughs> getting going, I'm not a fan of the wacky outfit. I, I don't know what that's for. I, I don't know, but I guess the young generation is what they are. They're, they're weird, but... All respect to Joe Burrow. Hope he can get it done. Matthew Stafford, all respect in the world as well. Enduring what he did all the years in Detroit and all those unbelievable seasons. He had multiple 5,000-yard seasons. Incredible uh, chemistry with him and Calvin Johnson. It was an unbelievable offense in Detroit. And they had a good defensive line as well. Isn't that ironic? <laughs> that that, uh, that Detroit team was actually kind of almost similar to this L.A. team. Just not as deep. Not as deep. Not as... Not as many stars, not as glitzy, but it was kind of similar. You had the great offense with an unbelievable league MVP caliber receiver, Galvin Johnson with Matthew Stafford, a quarterback, a great defensive line, but they just couldn't get it done when it mattered. Because, I mean, Detroit has the, the least successful franchise in the Super Bowl era, and an amazing and frustrating and sad statistic that came my way just yesterday. I believe it was on Mackie and John or Purple Daily, but basically in that combination unbelievable statistic in that era is <laughs> since the uh, since the 1970s since 1977 the Minnesota Vikings and the Detroit Lions teams that were still in existence at the time all the way till now are the only two teams in the NFL that have not at least reached a Super Bowl since the 1977 wrap your head around that they all have made it, all of them. Green Bay, Chicago, Cincinnati, you can go on. Um, and, of course, see, the Cleveland Browns became the Baltimore Ravens. They went to the Super Bowl. And then the new Cleveland Browns, you know, obviously they had a, what, what are those, a five-year hiatus. So they didn't start playing until 2000, uh, 99, part of it. Texans didn't start playing until 2005. And both the Jaguars and the, and the Carolina Panthers went to the Super Bowl at least once. Tennessee Titans to the Super Bowl. You can go on and on with all of New Orleans Saints, who were the worst team ever, basically, until, you know, Drew Brees got there. Think about that. Think about it. Think about how bad the L.A. Rams were, too, at, at times. I mean, they weren't always a good team. <laughs> they, they definitely weren't most of the time. It's their first Super Bowl in the city of L.A. They won it with St. Louis. Yeah, in St. Louis. A weird situation there, considering they'd lost the Cardinals. They get the Rams of all teams, the L.A. Rams, go to St. Louis, win a Super Bowl, and then years, you know, and then they suck for years, and then go back to L.A., still sucking. And then this young Sean McVay emerges, and eventually history would uh, head in the direction of a Vince Lombardi trophy, finally getting the city of L.A., other than the Los Angeles Raiders, in 1983. Or 82, pardon me, way back in the day. 83, 82, way back in the day. Um, I kept getting them mixed up with Washington. I think Washington won in 83. Yep. Nope. It was the Raiders in 83. Washington was 82. That was Joe Gibbs' first title with the Redskins. 82-87 against us, unfortunately, in the NFC title game. And 91, which was in the Metrodome versus the Bills. So, again, it was a good game. Very dramatic. Very sad ending. Broke my heart. Let me tell you, it broke my heart. And, again, I feel for Cincy fans today... Very well played, and hoping Cincinnati can uh, shore up that offensive line. We can relate to that around here. (laughs) Hopefully they can shore up that offensive line. I hope it for the best there. With that, we'll take a break and get to fan interaction.
And we are back here for fan interaction. Let's get to it quickly. I better get moving. It's later than I thought here on Tuesday morning. Got to get moving to work and all that. Mad Martin, this is Twitter, of course, at Purple Mafia Show, at Purple Mafia Show. Mad Martin says, with you on this, brother. I believe I was ranting about the halftime show. I said, oh, goody, a crap music fest. Notice I put a C in front of rap. Yeah, that's pretty much how I feel about rap. Today, it's horse. It's the worst. It's the worst ever. But even back then, I wasn't a fan. It just sounded better now because compared to today's music. You, you know how that kind of stuff works. It's like you get conditioned when you get something even so terrible. Something that was bad in the past isn't as bad. See? Okay, kind of like late 90s music, too. It actually sounds kind of good now. Ugh, that's funny. I hated, yeah. Okay, oh, goody, a crap music fest would rather count cracks on the ceiling blindfolded. Mad Martin out of Northern Scotland says, with you on this, brother. Thank you, I appreciate that. I was saying how, I was saying glad to hear it, and this is old school. Think about that. The stuff today is ten times worse. Mad Martin says, I don't listen to modern shit. And boy, neither do I, Mad Martin. We are on one million percent uh, agreement there. <laughs> modern. Sometimes it gets forced down my throat at, at, uh, at where I work, which is annoying. Absolutely annoying. And I try, try my best to avoid that from happening and snapping. I was saying bleep, bleep anyone cheering for L.A. I was saying bleep L.A. and bleep anyone cheering for L.A. I was kind of doing one of those, you know, yeah, where you, you just... It was the moment where I was just ranting and mad because, yeah, when when Cincinnati couldn't get going uh, for that final drive, that historic drive that would have been so beautiful if it was like a Joe Montana-like drive. The ultimate way to exercise your demons, losing in the Super Bowl twice to Joe Montana, would have been so cool if Joe Burrow was able to accomplish that. But that Rams defense just was ready to go, and Cincinnati wasn't. Malcolm McSween has, like, a uh, gremlin. That's not Yoda. That's gremlins hiding into the little bag, like, uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> so he must have been in L.A., of course. Malcolm McSween is from Southern California. So, yeah, it is what it is. And then he was, uh, I was saying, well, absolutely never root for a Los Angeles franchise for the rest of my life, ever. Bleep you, Los Angeles. And then Malcolm McSween says, boo, boo. Yep. I don't know if he's making fun of me. <laughs> I, I think so. He's from Southern California, so he's probably got a little bit of L.A. ties going on there. Malcolm McSween's one of the coolest people in the world, so I have no no dislike for anything there. And it's kind of fun that you have, you've been making fun of me a little bit there, and I have no problem with it. It's just a crappy moment, and it still it still sticks in my mind, you know, and it, it still hurts, actually, <laughs> because, I mean, I, I feel for Cincinnati. I just do. Danae Brown says, I like a few of their players as being L.A., Stafford, Donald, Miller, Miller. No, yeah, yeah, Savon Miller with Denver. He was awesome. Cooper, Cup. Can't stand OBJ, though. Makes me hate the Rams, haha. I agree. I agree. I don't like OBJ at all. Uh, I don't like the purple hair and all that funky stuff. I'm just not a fan of all that stuff. Stop making it about you. I'm expressing myself. Question. For the young people out there, this is not to be offensive or rude to anybody of any kind. This is not about race or anything. It's about generation. What are you expressing? Question, what are you expressing by having purple hair? I, I don't get it. <laughs> Seriously. Next, was great seeing Ramsey getting roasted today too. Oh, yes. I, he, he is an asshole. <laughs> it was, he, he's an asshole. It's hard to root for somebody like that, just like uh, Richard Sherman. Asshole. Uh, today, again, this is New Zealand. Today from New Zealand. Too bad the Bengals couldn't get it done. Would have been awesome if they did. And Amen. I Man, that was hard. It was heartbreaking. Malcolm McSween says, "Ha ha, gladly I was kind of just enjoying the game. Didn't care too much either way." Yep. Dave Hickey, out of Iowa, says, "I don't like any California teams or no Florida teams. The land of fruits and nuts." Yes, yes. I think I think we're on the same page about that. And yep, Sam Gupta, who's also out of California, was saying, "Yep, nice. I've cooled off a little bit now." I was saying that. Malcolm and Sam, both from California, by the way. We're kind of, yeah, we're, yeah, we are, we're, we're okay. Obviously, I'm not against anybody. I was just mad. <laughs> I was just mad. It, my competitive juices were on, like, overdrive at that moment. I mean, a close game like that, and when you can't get the first down, and, and it looked like, felt like their L.A. was kind of, kind of like, you know, dancing on their grave. It drove me nuts. It felt like Aaron Donald was dancing on their grave a little bit, but, uh, you know, anytime you see the wrong team win, you're going to get, pissed off and want to punch him in the face and be a poor sport. That's just kind of how I am, unfortunately. Dave Hickey says, sorry I missed commenting on, but I'm sure I'm sure I, I love the listening. This is again on the Kevin O'Connell show as we go into 
the Purple Mafia Show. It's facebook.com forward slash Purple Mafia Show. So this is the Facebook account. Mark Carlson says, what an unexpected show. Sweet. Yep, you're welcome. Also, again, do get on board the Vigit application, vigit.com. Again, just jump on board. It is a uh, an app on Apple and Android devices, of course. When they ask for a referral, just put in Paladino Live. That is in the show description. It is social media for sports bettors. You can post about your picks, see what others are saying about games. Vigit Betting League is a month-long betting competition to see who the Spets sports better is over the course of a month. Free to play sports book. Bet free coins, win real prizes. There's also great information available on the Vigit Like Line Movement, where the public is betting. This is not real money wagering. It is fantasy betting and highly recommended. It's a lot of fun, especially as we get closer and closer now into March Madness. It's not too far away anymore. It is It is February 15th, and I hope everyone had a happy Valentine's Day as well. Um, and again, here's the conversation about Vikings expected to hire former Broncos defensive coordinator Ed Donatell as DC to Minnesota. Ah, uh, they're all relevant, of course. Wish they could, I wish I could disable that. Dave Hickey and Tene Brown, cool. Dave Hickey says, I've heard about him. I don't know a lot about him, but if he's been following Vic Fangio for years, then it sounds like a good hire. Yep, same, same, same here. I agree with that thought process. Similar to Kevin O'Connell and Sean McVay. Uh, the Sean McVay coaching tree has been incredibly successful. Tene Brown, New Zealand, says, I only saw the start. I thought we've hired Vic Fangio. Ha ha. Still not a bad hire, in my opinion. No, it, it should be. Should be okay. And I'm hoping for the best there. Whew. Yep, the Super Bowl comments. Yep, except Mark Carlson. Yep, dominated that, which is totally cool. Uh, Mark Carlson's at 23-20 to 20 Rams with a minute and 25 on the clock. It's been a great game to watch. Yeah, there was plenty of time, and they had plenty of timeouts, so they just couldn't move, them being Cincy. I mean, there was plenty of time for a game-winning drive, which... I, I would think most NFL fans would have liked to have seen that happen. At least force overtime or something, but it's with the best kicker in the league, Ed, Ed McPherson. Well, one of the best, obviously. He's got to be up there. Mark Carlson says, uh, uh, let's go with this one first. Catching the game with family at my son's home in South Dakota. Cool. Halftime. And I know better than to hang out and watch the halftime show. Yep, <laughs> I feel you there. Mark Ellis says, after game comment, those quarterbacks were very entertaining tonight. I enjoyed seeing the deep passing game for both teams. I could do with less hype before the game, yes. And I've seen enough stupid commercials to last me the rest of the year. These two teams surprised me. I had no idea they were that good. Skull, yep, they were both very good. Uh, the commercials are, are terrible now. And it seems like it's just political messages they're sending. And it's all from one side. It is. And it is. Uh, <laughs> I would hope most people uh, can, can can tell what's going on there. Um, at the end of the day, that's the end of Facebook. So, and again, I don't mean to get political. I apologize if I'm getting political. Fe uh, freedom of thought, though, for some people might might uh, see the world the way I do. That's a podcast I've started out there as well. Uh, Mark Carlson, big, big, big piece of that, and I really appreciate him. He's uh, put some nice big comments on there, and I need to get another show out. Thank you, Mark, out of Iowa. The awards for last week and this week, which I apologize, Mark Carlson, because I didn't give any awards last week. Mark Carlson's going to get the gold star. I'm going to look, dig really quick here, but Mark Carlson is going to get the gold star. Leland will get the silver, like a gold-plated silver. Dave Hickey, Tanay, and... I think uh, Dave Vicky and Leland should get the uh, Silver Star. Tanae Brown and Mr. Tanae Brown and Dave Martin will get the Bronze Star. Uh, obviously, again, thank you guys so much for your inclusion with the show. Really appreciate it. Apologize. Some of you, I mean, you all deserve stars. You're all like the greatest people in the world. You you make this show worth it for me, and God bless you. I, I just, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you, and it's been an amazing football season. There's going to be another show coming up very soon, where we talk more and more about Kevin O'Connell and the coach, and the coaching and the directions we're going in the future, but it looks like more passing and all that, uh, more passing, more aggressive, That's which is good, but possible 3-4 defense, this and that, so we'll see how that goes. With that, please write a positive rating on, on uh, iTunes, if you could, uh, there's also Stitcher or Audible. And then on Spotify, you can uh, at least do a star rating of some kind, one through five, hopefully a five. Four is okay, but hopefully five. I prefer that <laughs> if possible. would be greatly appreciated. 
Uh, final thing, please call into the show. Those of you that have, I just love you to death. Thank you so much. And anybody that's willing to in the future, please do. Yeah, I hope I didn't miss anybody, <laughs> which my luck I may have. I might think around here as I'm talking. I don't think so, though. Nope, I don't see Gerald or anybody. Usually he uh, gives me a private message to alert me, cause, which is smart to do, actually. Uh, those of you that know me, yeah, let me know at times. But yeah, I should always check anyway, regardless if people notify me or not. Um, so that's on me if I miss it. It's not your fault. Um, but if you'd like to call into the show, please use a free, uh, any type of free voice recording application on any smart device on the planet. They all have it. Just open it up, uh, press, press record, treat it like a phone call, hit stop, and then share it slash email it to paladinolive at yahoo.com. Paladino Live at yahoo.com. I will then change it into an MP3 file thanks to zumzar.com. Again, thank you in advance. It would be great to have you on board. And Zumzar, always thank you for that free service. Highly recommend it. It starts with a Z, Zumzar. Yep, so with that, have a good week, good couple days, whatever it is. Until the next show, we'll talk about Kevin O'Connell, Kevin O'Connell, and more Kevin O'Connell moving forward. Mm-hmm.